Hawk on um, a slow loss of northern forest icons, um, dynamics of boreal birds at the edge of their range in the Adirondack Park. So bringing a little regional diversity into our city today. Yeah. So somebody magically, you, could you turn the lights down a little bit? Because you were so awesome about it last time. <laughs> you just magically did it. quickly mention that my uh, co-author on this work is here, Steve Langdon, who is in the second row. So if you have hard questions, especially related to plants, that's Steve all um, This work is work that uh, we've been doing, I've been doing for lots of years through the Wildlife Conservation Society Adirondack Program, which has since been terminated, unfortunately. So I'm now at Felsworth College at the Adirondack Watershed Institute, but we're very much a continue all of this work. I've been working with Steve, um, who's with Shaker Canyon Preserve and Research Station, and with Carla and others at the Northeast Climate Science Center for the Media of the West Coast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, we have been following a suite of species in the Adirondacks for a number of years, going all the way back as far as 2003 2004, with kind of a decent data set that spans about 2007 to 2016, which is most of what I'll talk about. Um, we've been tracking these species in low elevation world habitats in the Adirondacks. There are 12 sort of official studies. We'll really talk about eight of them. Um, that's because the other four, the three toad woodpecker and the three budworm warblers, I just don't find often enough to actually say anything about, unfortunately. Um, but the other, the other eight that you're talking about. I put this in for the plant-oriented folks. <laughs> I tend to be one of those that thinks primarily about the animals and everything else's habitat, but if you're interested in the exact kind of habitats that we're working in, this is how they would be characterized <coughs> according to the TNC um, Northeast Terrestrial Habitat classification. So our sites are all at low elevation. We specifically did not target high elevation conifer communities as part of this work because the Mountain Bird Watch Program already existed and was tracking those at high elevation. So there are some Corollary certainly in, in high conifer habitats, and some of the same birds that we, we track in the lowlands are also viewed in high elevation habitats. So cutting straight to the chase, because some of this stuff is already published, um, looking at the birds after a decade or so and then creating occupancy models, um, this is the kind of the picture that has emerged from this work. This started as a state wildlife grant project with really not a long-term monitoring focus, but we kind of managed to scrape together various sources of funding and keep it going for long enough that we can now look at the trends. And these are occupancy trends, so this is probability that, um, you know, probability you can find any of these birds in one of our sites and or the proportion of our sites that's occupied by them. This is about 60 sites that have been regularly surveyed over, over the years. And the, the thing that has sort of become the story of this work is that most of those trends are pointing downward. Um, palm warbler is the exception. It's been increasing in the United States. It increased a lot between the two breeding dialysis. But most of the others, Grey is a little bit of an exception. I'm sorry, I still call it Grey um, It's now the Canada Jay. But, but they're all sort of going down. These are multi- subsequent years based on the colonization and extinction rates, you can ask the models to tell you the exact occupancy for each year. These models have really high error and I wouldn't put my money on them, but um, but you can do that and even when you do do that and run a trend line through those sort of year-to-year -year occupancy values, it's still generally a downward pointing trend for most of these species, with the exception of palm and, and gray jay, which is kind of seems to be kind of stable. And this has become kind of um, a key concern for us is that, you know, these birds appear to be maybe moving out of the Adirondack landscape. As a part of this work, we did evaluate the influence of a number of different drivers on creating those trends. And what we found was that um, some things that, that we would have predicted were supported by what we see in our data. One is that they do, they do sort of conform to what you would expect from a metapopulation type of system. These are patchy bits of boreal that are in a sea of sort of the more traditional northern harbor forest that is most of the Adirondacks. So that it's a patchy type of system. We find that they're more likely to colonize and to stick around in larger wetlands and wetlands that are more connected. We also found that human footprint does have an influence on these species also. Um, places that are closer to roads, houses, infrastructure are less likely to be colonized and less likely to, to have birds remain in them. 
We also looked at latitude and elevation as potential drivers of these trends. And what we found there was that kind of a mixed uh, signal with some species seemingly moving up in latitude over the course of the 10 years, um, but others not showing that. And in fact, many that seemed to maybe be moving up in latitude were moving down in elevation. So those were kind of proxies for thinking about climate change at that time. And this is, this is in a 2014 paper in North and um, how we did all of these analysis. But, but what we've been focusing on more recently, what I want to talk more about, um, is actually the, the actual climate change piece. So what we've been doing um, in the past couple of years with support from USDS uh, is to look specifically at the role of climate in influencing some of these trends, um, and then trying to figure out if we can identify a refugia a la um, Tony Lynn's work figure out if there are places that are holding on to these more than other places are. So we've used climate data from pr the PRISM um, product. This is, of course, a model uh, climate product that we are you know, at the same situation as many others of having very few weather stations. So we've used these kind of gridded products. But we did do that, and we extracted from them information on the means, the variability, and the extremes in both breeding and winter season temperature and precipitation and then just looked at those covariates as drivers of the trends in these birds, and then kind of compared to, to those other things that we already looked at. So this is a um, incredibly <coughs> steep simplification of, of lots and lots of models, but ignoring the graphic for a minute and just talking about the, the sort of broader things that I found on the right-hand side there, I found, at least in, in the data that I've been looking at, that the, the sort of long-term average in terms of temperature and precipitation, had more explanatory power for, for determining where these birds were going to colonize and persist than did the variability or the extremes. I know that's an open question in lots of climate science, and at least in this context, they, they sort of responded more to the long-term average. Uh, with respect to sort of breeding season versus winter, the breeding season conditions were more powerful in explaining the patterns. Not surprising because all the birds are here in the breeding season. Uh, several of them are absent in the winter. Um, with respect to colonization and persistence, climate factors in particular were more um, indicative of what was happening with respect to persistence. So that's the flip side of extinction. The models give you extinction. I like to talk about it in terms of characteristics associated with persistence. But with respect to temperature versus precipitation, what I found there was that overall, precipitation tended to be a little bit more important in determining patterns across the species. But it was really split between those two dynamic rates, whereby likelihood of colonization was driven by precipitation characteristics, likelihood of uh, persistence in these habitats was much more strongly associated with temperature. So what's in the graphic here, again, <laughs> really strong simplification, leaving aside the variability and the extremes for a minute and just focusing on breeding in winter um, precipitation in the top two and then breeding in winter season temperature patterns characteristics. What I'm trying to show here is that the, the <coughs> width of those bars is kind of the cumulative model weight that you can attribute to that factor um, with respect to its influence either on persistence or on colonization. And then the amount of it that's sort of this side of what you might imagine as a zero line indicates what proportion of those species responded in a positive way to this factor versus what proportion responded in a negative way. So for example, with respect to colonization, breeding season temperature was a really important factor, and for most, um, or breeding season precip, and for most, in most cases it was a negative influence. Same for winter precipitation. With respect to persistence, temperature was more important, especially breeding season, but largely a positive influence. So these were, this is kind of a really mixed bag of species responses to these individual climate variables. So what we try to do now is to sort of look at not just the target species that we've been focused on in these habitats, but all the birds. I've been fortunate to have people that have worked on this project who tell me about all the birds. We know that climate is important. In fact, if you throw those climate variables into models with latitude, elevation, connectivity, wetland size, human footprint, you find that climate actually is a more important driver for most of these species than, is, than are those landscapes or context variables that we were looking at previously. So we know climate's important. And we know that the boreal birds appear to be leaving. <laughs> so who's going to come in after them? We've been trying to look at broader patterns of community change. Um, what is going to be the characteristic bird community in some of these places? And are there places where maybe we're losing them more slowly in other places? Maybe that might be a refugia. So with respect to the community changes, what I did was to just take all of the species for which we had enough data to also calculate the kind of 
trends, and that was roughly 50 or 60 species, and then just look at guilds and try to figure out if there was any explanatory power within guilds of birds that determined you know, who's coming in and who's leaving. And the only two guilds that really had any kind of statistical power to explain what that sort of lambda parameter is, is was it a boreal, <laughs> boreal species? Those were the ones that were leaving. Um, or was it a flycatcher? And decline of flycatchers is, is kind of um, noticed, certainly already. Um, but there might be patterns here that the bird folks in the room would recognize. We're seeing in our sites, at least, an increase in forest generalists. Um, forest species generally are doing, doing well in most places in the east. I'm not surprised to see an increase in southern species in these habitats, also an increase of in commensal or human adapted kinds of species, and then some decline in, in some interesting species on the other side. But really it was that boreal guild and then a handful of other species that were showing the strongest decline. Unfortunately, the ones that we're trying to find in these habitats are the ones that are leaving. So the last thing that we tried to do was to, to, to see if we could sort of flip this analysis on its head instead of focusing on the individual species themselves, focusing on the types and whether we can pull apart characteristics of, of the sites that are kind of enabling them to hold on to a more northern bird kind of community. And I looked at a couple of different characteristics thinking about what might influence um, extinction rates of oil birds. So splitting our sites into three levels just with a cluster analysis of kind of high, medium, low levels of, of extinction in that oil bird guild, I looked at potential drivers of competition. Are they separated by you know, levels of colonization of, of competitors, either southern species or, or more generalist kind of commensal species? Is habitat an important driver of these factors? And then last, climate stability, and this is right out of Tony Lynn's work, one way we might define a refugia is a spot where the climate is sort of more than it was in the past, has deviated less um, from, from historical patterns than it did more recently. So I looked at um, the climate, temperature, precipitation characteristics, and the time of our study and compared it to the normals and looked at how they deviated from the normal patterns. What I found was that the places that were keeping their royal birds, the, the spots that had the highest persistence, were sites that did have lower colonization rates of both southern species uh, and commensal species. They were sites that had lower deviation from uh, climate normals with respect to winter precipitation specifically. <coughs> And they were sites that were dominated primarily by that northern peatland type. So for us in the Adirondacks, these are the big, big open bogs. We have some of them that are you know, hundreds and hundreds of acres. Those seem to be the sites that are kind of keeping the boreal birds longer than the other sites. <laughs> one, one quick caveat to all this, all of the, all of the climate stuff, is that we're using a modeled, um, we're using this modeled prism product to do this stuff. Steve actually has temperature loggers in some of these big open box, some of the ones that I've worked in, and some separate ones that he's he's been working in separately. And when he asks those data loggers how their data <laughs> compares to the prism data, what he finds is that. You know, the minimum daily temperatures are two degrees colder than what PRISM says. The means are a degree warmer. The maxes are three and a half degrees warmer. So perhaps the extremes are more extreme than what the, the PRISM model is showing us, it's particularly in these open bog landscapes. Even more troubling, perhaps, when he asks the question of um, what's the number of, it's duration of the number of frost-free days, right? So growing season as defined by number of days with no frost. Then we have a total sort of decoupling of what the PRISM model says versus um, what his data letters say. So I don't, all of this is not to say that I think we're necessarily wrong about the climate stuff, but I think that there's a lot, lot more that we could explore. It would be wonderful to have data loggers in all these sites. It would be wonderful to explore things like cold air pooling and those kinds of patterns that might help us explain some of what we're seeing with the birds. So last, just to try to capture what I think, you know, a good site looks like. The top of the top uh, seven on these lists, I think, are, are pretty. You know, I can strongly say that the, the spots that are good for our birds have a lot of open peatland. They're large. They're connected. They're at high latitude and low elevation. They tend to be in the northwest sort of quadrant of the Adirondack Park. They don't have a lot of, of development within them, and they therefore have fewer of the sort of commensal species. The warm and dry thing is interesting to me. We found generally a positive association of, of these species with warmer temperatures. I can hypothesize why that way might be. You know, it might create more insect uh, <coughs> for them. But we know that the we know the temperature is going to get warmer. We know that the climate is warming. 
Um, and we know that precipitation is also increasing. But the pattern seems to be um, that we're going to see that precipitation primarily in the winter and spring. If we have sort of hotter and drier in the summer, in the breeding season when the birds are here, that I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, is the kind of thing that can flip these systems and let the trees run out over the sphagnum. And then we get the encroachment of trees and they suddenly become a different kind of system than the big open peatland. And then ultimately, I don't know what that means for all of these birds. So right now, this is, this is a great set, but long term, I'm not sure what the future is for these species. Thanks. You mentioned um, some of the effects of, of the presence of people on these birds, and I think you had referenced roads and, and development just as a general category. Do you have a sense for whether um, outdoor recreation activities and you know different levels of, of human presence through trails and that sort of thing is having an effect on these species? I have looked at that just a little bit. One of the challenges in the Adirondacks is trying to model what that recreation looks like. We have some good data for what happens at the trailhead, but less, you know, a lot of these sites are not sort of trailhead locations. A lot of them are aquatic transects, actually, so it's a little bit hard to capture, especially in the aquatic realm. But to the extent that I have looked at it, I definitely see a signal there, and it's, it's interesting. And that tends to be one of the things that I write about in my public comment letters to the state. <coughs> a lot of this boreal habitat is on state land and or on conservation easement land. And so one of the key sort of management decisions that they're often making it is, is not whether or not there's development, but what kind of recreation they allow and when and all of that. And I think it does, because these are, these are sort of really specialized types of birds. Tim, you had your hand up? It's so nice did. to see you. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, what about the forest habitat? Has that, I, I, forgive me if I missed this, but over what period of time did you collect the bird data? And if, in conjunction with that, has the forest changed at all during so that time? The, the data collection, the, most of the data I've talked about is a 10 year period of time, and we haven't, we, we have done some collecting of habitat data on the ground, but partly limited by the fact that in some cases we're both doing these transects. It's all been kind of very um, qualitative. <laughs> This is why I brought Stephen to the project, because he's the person that can understand the habitat in a, in a much better way than I have. We haven't assessed the change in the habitats. I'd love to do that. I'd love to figure out if we are seeing encroachment of trees in some of these places, and some of Steve's work is related to that. But we haven't gone specifically after getting deep into the habitat relationships. It's sort of the next step, and we've been working with Tony DeMano here at UVM and some others who are modeling some of the changes that we expect to see, and hopefully we can continue to look at that. Um, so I guess I, when I think about this kind of research, it's really interesting. It's kind of like the battlegrounds of climate change and the boreal forest. And maybe there's not a whole lot we can do to save them on this southern range, but these just seem like such important lessons that could be conveyed to the, to the kind of core of the boreal forest. And so I was just curious about what kind of information exchange there is between the stuff that you're finding and, and the Canadian. If there is, like, I know that... <laughs> I think that's a great way that all of us could like, yeah. build on this work. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm a month and a week into the new job and haven't developed those relationships. WCS did have a lot of people in Canada, but they weren't doing bird work yet. And they were, and, well, some were, but in that far western world, it's kind of a different system. So uh, we didn't get too far down that road, except other than talking about the fact that we talked. Any final question? Yes. So, um, to what do you attribute the um, colonization being due more to precipitation and the persistence due more to temperature? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I really don't. I try to. I, I should say that I, I modeled. You know, you can you can do the models as you know year to year fluctuation in all of those variables. Um, and when I model it that way, it, they just fail. It doesn't work. So it's, you're looking at long term averages. Why it is that colonization would be more related to precipitation persistence temperature, I think. This is all sort of the new climate realm for me. <laughs> We're open to suggestions. We're open to yeah. suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you, McKaylee.